So last time I was uh, discussing coverings, and um, I answered one question wrong, so I want to uh, fix that. The question is, uh, is the log uh, defining a branch covering, or does the log, does log z define a branch cover? And I think I'll go to ask that. And um, the answer is no. I said yes last time. And uh, the way to see that is, you see, there's a perfectly good covering, the exponential map, from C to C star. Okay? So Z goes to exponential of 2 pi i C. And that's an infinite sheeted covering. That's a topological covering. Now remember that a branched cover means that you have pairs y r going to x b so that uh, y minus the ramification locus over x minus the branch locus is a well-defined covering and the ramification locus over the branched locus is a well-defined covering. But you see, if you try and include the uh, origin here, if you try to extend this to a map of CP1 to, uh, say, C, that won't work. Um, the logarithm is not well defined at the origin. And um, if you try to look at uh, the exponential map at infinity, sometimes it's going to zero, sometimes it's going to infinity, depending on what the sign of the imaginary part uh, is. And, uh, and so that does not extend to what we would want to call the branch locus. Okay, so that's one correction to what I said. Now, I also started to talk about Riemann surfaces. And today I'm going to say some more things about Riemann surfaces. <coughs> I'll try not to overlap too much with what I said last time. Now, our our initial motivation for discussing Riemann surfaces is that it's a nice illustration of covering theory. But there are also some other motivations I should mention. One is, of course, uh, the theory of Riemann surfaces is, is crucial in perturbative string theory. And it's also coming up in conformal field theory in two dimensions in an essential way. And it also it plays a key role, more surprisingly, in supersymmetric gauge theory. And then finally, it comes up in integrable systems in an essential way, through spectral curves. So there are a lot of applications in string theory and mathematical physics that involve Riemann surfaces in an important way. So although it's not going to be our uh, main focus, this is more of a digression from our main theme, our main themes of, of bundles and connections on bundles, it's a worthwhile detour. So I started to talk about that a little bit last time. So let me remind you that by definition, uh, a Riemann surface is a one-dimensional um, complex curve or an alternative definition is that it's a uh, oriented real uh, two manifold with a conformal class of a metric. So let me explain how those are related. So what I mean by a conformal class of a metric is the following. If I have
have one metric on my Riemann surface, on my oriented two-dimensional surface, um, then I'll say that it's a, a vial transformation takes this metric to e to the um, 2 phi uh, g mu nu dx mu times our dx nu if, now this is important, phi is globally well defined on the surface sigma. And so a conformal class is a class of Riemannian metrics up to such a vial transformation. Now, near any point, there exists an open set U so that one can put this metric in the form of what are called isothermal coordinates that is, there exists local complex coordinates so Z alpha here is say X alpha 1 plus I X alpha 2 so there exists local complex coordinates so that the metric can be put in this form. To make that plausible, you see the metric looks like this. It's G11, G22, G12, G12 of X locally. So there are three functional degrees of freedom. Now, we're allowed to make uh, coordinate redefinitions, so those are diffeomorphisms, so that's two degrees of freedom. And we're allowed to make these vial transformations, and that's one degree of freedom. Okay, so you see the only, just counting degrees of freedom, you see that there are three local degrees of freedom, and therefore it shouldn't be surprising that under those transformations you can turn this into a Euclidean metric. Okay, so you can do that, and um, and then if we do that on various patches, if we have a compact surface, we'll only need a finite set of patches. So then, on overlaps of these patches, we'll have e to the two phi alpha d z alpha squared equals e to the two phi beta dz beta squared, and with a little thought, which I'll leave to you, you can check that with proper orientations, uh, the z alphas have to be analytic functions of the z betas, so the coordinate uh, transformations, dz alpha by dz beta, are holomorphic on u alpha beta, and in that way we get a one-dimensional complex manifold. Okay, so I skipped over that rather too quickly last time. And another thing I skipped over rather too quickly last time, I think, is the relationship of pi 1 and h1. So let me say that a little more slowly. So one thing I'm not going to explain again is that um, what, what is pi 1 of a Riemann surface? Well, you see you can choose a base point, b naught, and then you can cut your surface open. And here, it would be good to use colored chalk, but I've already explained this. So um, if you cut it open, then you see that uh, pi 1 of a Riemann surface, based at some point like this, it is isomorphic to a, a, um, a discrete group presented in terms of generators and relations. in this way. So if I have genus G, then I have a product of commutators uh, equals 1. And if I want to put in some punctures, say there are k punctures, p1 through pk, then I'll have pi gk, and I'll have to take the product here from 
i equals 1 to k of, say, gamma, let's call it gamma sub s, gamma sub s equal, equals 1. So those are called surface groups. They're just certain discrete groups. I, I want to stress that they're, in a sense, very large in general. Notice that, for example, uh, pi 0 n is equal to the free group on n minus 1 generators. Okay. Oh, do, yeah. do you have any ordering for those gamma? Uh, yeah, yeah, you need to order them. That's right. Now, different orderings will relate, be related by monomorphisms, but you definitely need to order them. And um, similarly, if you take uh, pi 1, 1, the um, fundamental group of a torus with one puncture, then that will be the free group on two generators. So roughly speaking, these things are as big as, as, as a free group because there's only one relation. There are lots of generators and only one relation. Now, what about H1? Well, H1 can be thought of in two ways. One way is to think of it as the abelianization of pi 1. Okay, so if you abelianize things, then you just uh, make all these alpha gammas and betas commute. So the commutators are one, and you just get one simple relation there. And then what you get is something which is a, a free group on k generators, on, on these generators. Now you can also think of it geometrically. As, um, which is the, more properly the definition of homology in general, as uh, uh, closed one cycles modulo boundaries of um, what are called two chains, but we can think of them as boundaries of pieces of surface of, say, sigma prime, which is sitting inside sigma. So if I can find a gamma and a gamma tilde, and I can find some bit of surface, sigma prime, that, that uh, fills in the difference so that its boundary is this one to this, everything has to be oriented here, then, um, then I would say that the homology class of sigma is the homology class of Sorry, the homology class of gamma is the homology class of gamma tilde. And so you see, group theoretically, there's a large kernel in the projection. So there's a homomorphism from pi 1 of sigma to h1 of sigma. It's clearly onto by this definition. And the kernel is the abelianization. And that's still big. So, for example, if I took a Riemann surface like this, and put the curve like that, that C there is homologically trivial, but homotopically non-trivial. You see, it's homologically trivial because with the proper orientation, it's the boundary of that piece of subsurface. But homotopically, it's still non-trivial. You can't continuously deform that curve to a point. Just keeping it as a curve. All right. Now, the nice thing, uh, well, one nice thing about this homology group, which you see is, is just some, some lattice, is that there's an intersection form. on H1. And so the way we define that is we define local intersections 
numbers of transversely intersecting pieces of arc. So whenever you see a picture that looks like this, say this is C1 and this is C2, and they're intersecting transversely at some point P, then you say that the local intersection number of C1 and C2 is equal to plus 1, and uh, then it's anti-symmetric. So this is equal to minus the local intersection number of C2, C1. And then if you have uh, two cycles, you define the intersection number of that to be the, 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 the sum over all of the intersections of the cycles of I sub P of gamma 1, gamma 2. So it's a sign sum over the number of intersections. And this descends to homology. So, you see, if I have a homologically trivial curve, then its intersection number is zero with um, any, any other homology class. So, for example, you see, if I chose a non-zero homology class like this, well, I'll get a plus one from here and a minus one from here, so the intersection of C with that gamma is zero. Okay, so um, this descends to homology, and so it defines an uh, anti-symmetric integral value form on H1 of sigma and Z. Now, on, on very general uh, principles, uh, whenever you have a uh, anti-symmetric integral value form on a lattice, you can always choose a basis that looks like this, and so on. And then, and then in general, there will be a kernel an annihilator, where it's the form is just equal to zero. So, when the genus, uh, when, when, the, when k is zero, and uh, the surface is compact, so sigma is compact, no punctures, then Poincaré duality tells us that all the di's are zero, uh, excuse me, compared to one, okay. And um, indeed, so we get a, we know that there exists a basis that looks like this. And indeed, we can draw such a basis. So let me draw a genus G curve. Okay. And um, I could choose my alpha cycles, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha g, and oriented this way, and my beta cycles, beta 1, beta 2, beta g, oriented this way, and the intersection form will be just like this. Now you notice that when I've gone from um, homotopy, where I have to have a base point, so I have my curves all have a base point here, when I've gone to homology, I forget about this base point, um, because I can move curves around because of this equivalence, and so they don't have to have the same base point. Then when I have punctures, supposing I have punctures, you know, here, 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 well, I can choose little cycles around the punctures. It's clear that they aren't intersecting anybody else. And so it's the punctures that give us the annihilator of the intersection form. Are there any questions about that? When you define this H1, where, where do you use Z? You say H1 ah, of Z. Yeah, okay. So, you see, I'm 
talking about a free abelian group here, so there's a z here. So I'm I I'm using the z because I'm only taking integral combinations of the alpha i. So this would be a typical element in this group where these are integers. Now, if I wanted to change the coefficient group to some other abelian group, mm -hmm. then I would take those to be in that abelian group. Okay. So there's no torsion here, so it's really not a big deal. But if there's torsion, um, then, then there are some interesting subtleties, the, uh, subtle differences between uh, the homology with integer coefficients and the homology with coefficients in another abelian group, they're not, they're one is not just the tensor product of the other. Okay. Okay, so that's about H1. Now let me say a few things, a few more things about uniformization. So I quoted a major theorem last time. Um, which says that the, the only simply connected uh, Riemann surfaces are uh, C, uh, C hat, C P1, the complex plane and the upper half plane, or the open unit disk. And what I want to add to that is that each admits a constant curvature metric. So what I mean by constant curvature is that in isothermal coordinates, the Riemann curvature scalar is minus e to the minus 2 phi um, 8 dz dz bar of phi. Let me write that as 4 here and 2 phi here. Because of course nobody will ever agree on whether they put e to the 2 phi dz squared or e to the phi dz squared. Okay. So that is the, uh, the curvature, that's the Riemann curvature in terms of uh, the, uh, the local vial or the scale up factor. Remember, this is all local. But of course, this is a scalar, so this is going to be well defined across coordinate patches as a single scalar function. And for CP1, we have uh, 4 dz squared over 1 plus z squared squared with r equals plus 2. For the complex plane, of course, we have the Euclidean metric with r equals 0. And for the upper half plane, we have dz squared over the imaginary part of z squared, the Poincaré metric, with constant negative curvature. So when the Euler character of sigma which is 2 minus 2g minus the number of punctures is negative, the universal cover that we discovered, that we discussed last time, is uh, sigma tilde equals the upper half plane. So we know that sigma is going to be the quotient of the upper half plane by some group, uh, gamma where gamma is isomorphic to this pi gk. Now, in fact, that gamma is going to be sitting inside the conformal automorphisms of H, which is PSL2R acting by Mobius transformation. So remember, Mobius transformations take uh, z goes to az plus d over cz plus 
D, where A, B, C, D is an SL2R. And I write PSL2R because you see the center acts trivially. So if you have a discrete subgroup that acts properly discontinuously on the upper half plane, uh, a discrete subgroup, oh, excuse me, yeah, conformal order morphisms of H, which is this. You have a discrete subgroup of PSL2R acting properly discontinuously by Mobius transformations, then you can quotient. And notice that this is invariant, so this descends to a constant negative curvature metric on the remote surface. Now, remote surfaces can be deformed. So we can speak of the space of Riemann surfaces. There's an interesting space of these. It's called the moduli space. I'll denote it as MGK. So it's, it's the parameter space of inequivalent Riemann surfaces. And we have two definitions here of Riemann surfaces. So we can approach it from various points of view. If we think of Riemann surfaces as a two-dimensional oriented real surface, uh, modulo the action of the diffeomorphisms and the vial transformations, then, that was my definition prime, then we think of MGK as an infinite dimensional space the space of all metrics on this surface divided by the uh, orientation preserving, that's the plus, diffeomorphisms, semi direct product with the vial rescalings of sigma. So you see a metric, G, goes to a pullback of G under F in the diffeomorphism group, and as I've already discussed, I can rescale G by a globally well-defined function. So the group of vial transformations is just the space of functions on the surface. Now, notice that you can um, fix the vial degree of freedom by requiring this constant curvature. So from this formula here, that means we want to solve an equation like d by d z alpha, d by d z bar alpha of uh, phi alpha, 2 phi alpha, plus mu over 4 e to the 2 phi alpha equals 0. And this is this famous Liouville equation. So you can relate, um, you can write a, a, a nice gauge slice for the action of the vial transformations by finding a constant negative curvature metric. From this point of view, thinking of uh, the surface as a quotient by a, a discrete subgroup of SL2R, you get as I just explained, the constant negative curvature for free. This Louisville equation is very important, very interesting, and it leads to uh, an important uh, class of conformal field theorems. Okay, now back to this point of view of the uh, moduli space. As I explained and have erased, all of the local degrees of freedom are used up in the two degrees of freedom in local diffeomorphisms, the two uh, degrees of freedom in vector fields, plus the third degree of freedom in the vial transformations. So you might expect uh, M of GK to be finite dimensional. And that's indeed the case, and I will 
calculate its dimension from a different point of view in just a second. But what I want to say right now is that if we only quotient by the connected component of the identity in the diffeomorphism group, inside the diffeomorphism group, then what we get, we get slightly different space. Let's call it TGK, which is the space of metrics, metrics on sigma divided by diff not plus of sigma semi-direct vial. Okay. Why should we want to do such a thing? What would we gain by doing this? Well, it turns out that this is a contractible space. That's, that's a big deal. Okay? This is called Teichmuller space. So the, not only do we see that um, Riemann surfaces are nice quotients of some simply connected contractible space by some complicated group, but also the parameter space, the moduli space of Riemann surfaces is a quotient by a contractible space by a, a complicated group. What is that complicated group? Well, that complicated group is evidently the quotient here. And this is known, this group here, is known as the modular group. So we have this picture that we have the Teichmuller space over the moduli space quotienting by the modular group. Now this is not quite a topological covering because this will act on the Teichmuller space with fixed points. So let me give you an example of all this. Let's consider a compact genus 1 curve. In other words, a torus well, that's got to be a quotient by some discrete group of conformal automorphisms. So those have to be a lattice of translations. So you see, if we take the uh, complex plane and we take two vectors which are not collinear, then they generate lattice, and if we quotient by that lattice, identifying this with this, and this with that, in this fundamental domain, then you see I get a torus. Now, as I told you, you can think about, uh, you can think about the moduli space by taking the constant curvature metrics on this, and the constant curvature metrics are just the flat metrics, so we can take uh, ds squared equals e to the 2 phi dz squared, okay, where phi is equal to a constant. And furthermore, by uh, rotating in the complex plane, we can put this omega 1 to 0, so we can write this as e to the 2 phi d sigma 1 plus tau d sigma 2 squared where sigma 1 is now going to be identified with sigma 1 plus 1, and sigma 2 is identified with sigma 2 plus 1. So we can write our, our flat metric in this form, and by proper orientation, we can require that the imaginary part of tau is positive. Okay? So you can always do that, and now if you're just using the local uh, vial transformations and the diffeomorphisms, well with vial transformations you could set that to a 1 if you wanted. Um, 
we have used up our freedom. So in this case, the tricolor space, P of G is 1 and 0 punctures, is equal to the upper half plane. Now, what is diff plus mod diff plus naught? Okay. Well, this turns out to be isomorphic to PSL to Z. And in fact, we can give a canonical diffeomorphism for each component of this labeled by an element of PSL to Z. And to do that, supposing I have A, B, C, D elements of SL to Z, then I consider the diffeomorphism, which takes sigma 1, sigma 2, goes to D, B, C, A of sigma 1, sigma 2. Now you see that A, B, C, and D are integers. So this transformation is compatible with this quotient here. So this really is a diffeomorphism of the torus. And you can also convince yourself that because it's an integer, um, it is a non-trivial diffeomorphism of the torus. You could, for example, study what this does to the homology classes and see that it really acts non-trivially on the homology. So it couldn't be that the diffeomorphism is homotopically uh, equivalent to the trivial uh, one, which is what would happen if the diffeomorphism were in the identity component of, of the diffeomorphism group. Now what happens when we make this, we make a pullback by this large diffeomorphism? Well, the metric pulls back to F star of ds squared is equal to e to the 2 phi. Okay, d sigma 1 now becomes d, d sigma 1 plus b, d sigma 2. And the d sigma 2 becomes c d sigma 1 plus a d sigma 2. But you see, I can rearrange that as e to the 2 phi of uh, c tau plus d d sigma 1 plus a tau plus b d sigma 2 squared. This is just a constant. So remember, I'm only looking at a conformal class of metrics. So I don't care about that overall constant. And I have a tau plus b over c tau plus d, d sigma 2 squared. Well, therefore, the action of the modular group on the tricolor space takes tau to tau plus 1. Sorry, tau to uh, a tau plus b over c tau plus d. So we have this famous relation. And so now we can make a, a picture of what uh, moduli space m10 looks like. To do that, we look at the upper half plane. And we, make, we, we find a fundamental domain for the action of this group. So we need to find a fundamental domain. Okay. Now, how are we going to find a fundamental domain? Well, to do that, we need to know something more about the group. We need to know something like the generators. So I'll just tell you that PSL2Z is generated by two famous transformations called T, which takes tau to tau plus 1, and S, which takes tau goes to minus 1 over tau. Now, what's the fundamental domain for the action of T? Well, one choice, it's just a choice, one choice is to take the strip between minus 1 half and plus 1 half. And now what's a choice of fundamental domain for tau goes to minus 1 over tau? Well, certainly 
the unit circle is another one. And so this region up here is the standard choice of fundamental domain for the action of the modular group. On the upper half plane, it's called the keyhole region. Notice that there's some special points in the keyhole region. There's this point here, tau equals i, which is fixed by s. And in this point here, tau equals e to the i pi over 3, which is fixed by s times t. And it turns out that those are the only fixed points. So now the modular group, the S, is actually identifying this region with this region here. And the T is identifying this region here with this region. So a picture of moduli space is that it looks something like this. It's a sphere with a puncture up at tau equals i infinity. And it has two orbifold points at tau equals i and tau equals e to the i pi over 3. So that's moduli space in genus 1. Now maybe this is the, uh, a good place to remark that um, at higher genus, the moduli space is actually topologically very complicated. So although tipolar space is contractible, if we divide out by uh, the modular group, then it turns out we get a space which is complicated. And one measure of that complication is a famous and beautiful result of Harar, Penner, and Zagier. Um, Harar, Penner, um, Harar and Zagier did it independently, Penner. And it turns out that the Euler character for genus G with one puncture is the zeta function at 1 minus 2G, which is a complicated number. That's equal to minus the Bernoulli number divided by 2G. Now, the Bernoulli number for large genus G will grow like 2G factorial. So this is big on the one hand. And secondly, the Bernoulli number is also a complicated fraction with very complicated denominators. Okay, So where are those denominators coming from? You couldn't get those denominators if you had, um, if you had a smooth quotient. The denominators are coming because you have these kinds of orbifold points. But I should have remarked that the orbifold points, in turn, are coming from the fact that there are surfaces with symmetries. See, what, what's the origin of these orbifold points? We're dividing by the diffeomorphism group, so we'll have an orbifold point when our surface has some symmetries. Right? So what does tau equals i correspond to? Well, you see, it corresponds to uh, 1 uh, i, sorry, i here, i plus 1 here. So if I take that torus, that torus clearly has some extra symmetry. Right? Brian, wake up. You, <laughs> wake up. Does this have some symmetry? Does anybody else see some symmetry here, if tau equals i? No? No, no symmetry. OK. Look. If I take a Riemann surface, I'm sorry, if I take a, a torus like this, in general, there's not going to be any symmetry. It's just going to be some distorted thing. But obviously, there's a 90 degree rotation here. Okay. That's the symmetry. And that's, going, that's why we have an orbital point. OK. Now, there's another way. I promised you that I would tell you something about the dimension of this moduli space. So there's another way of thinking about these, this moduli space by going back to this point of view of uniformization. We 
we divide, uh, we get our Riemann surfaces by dividing, um, by dividing the upper half plane by some discrete subgroup of PSL to R, which is isomorphic to this phi 1. So that suggests that instead of thinking of this infinite dimensional quotient of the space of all metrics by the infinite dimensional group of all diffeomorphisms and file transformations, we can make a kind of finite dimensional model. So let's consider the homomorphisms of this discrete group, pi gk, that I wrote before, into SL2R divided by conjugation. Clearly, if I can conjugate all of my elements, I'm not going to make a different Riemann surface. So, how do I write such a homomorphism? Well, to alpha i, I write an SL2R matrix AI. To beta i, I write some B i. To gamma s, I write some C sub s. So I need to choose some SL2R matrices. And what do I want them to do? I want them to have this product here, AI with B i, product s equals 1 to k of C sub s equals 1. So yes, the ordering matters a lot. Right? So I'm choosing, these are ordered products, because these are 2 by 2 matrices, the order matters. Now if I can find matrices that, look, that do this, then I'm in good shape, right? Because this is the one relation I need. So if I can find matrices that do this, then I have a homomorphism of pi into SL2R. So let's count the, the dimension of this space here. What's the dimension of the space of homomorphisms? You see, if I have a homomorphism, I could still imagine deforming the matrices A and B and C so that I preserve the relationship. Okay, how many parameters do I have? Well, each SL2R matrix has three real parameters. Right? Because we have four real matrix elements. Now why three parameters? Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I have three times two G plus K coordinates. But I'm imposing here how many equations? One, two. How many equations in terms of the real coordinates? One matrix equation. Four? Three, because the determinant is automatic. And as long as this is acting effectively, how many uh, dimensions are I, am I taking out by, by the quotient? Another 3. So I have 6g minus 6 plus 3k. Now, this isn't quite dipolar space. There are a few subtleties here. One is that this space has many components. You see, you could do something stupid. You could take all the generators here to 1. Okay? It's a component. It's a very singular component. It's not the one we want. One component is the one we want. And the other subtlety has to do with what's going on at these punctures. We need to fix a conjugacy class of C sub i s at each puncture. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, just put the number of punctures to zero. So that subtracts another minus k. 
So what we get is the dimension of T of T G K is equal, to, this is the real dimension, is 6 G minus 6 plus 2 K. Now, a uh, final remark is that this is Teichmuller space. So if we take a component here and we fix the uh, conjugacy class of the punctures, then we get Teichmuller space. We could further quotient by the automorphism group of pi gk. Now, the inner automorphisms are not going to do anything interesting because we're already quotienting by conjugation. So only the outer automorphisms of pi gk act effectively. And this is indeed another way of thinking about the modular group. So it's the group of outer automorphisms. OK, uh, one, one other, uh, two other remarks. Uh, one is, as I mentioned before, um, this Riemann surface theory is very important in perturbative string theory. And in perturbative string theory, what happens is the, uh, you express scattering amplitudes, for example, 2 to 2 scattering of strings, 2 go in, 2 go out, maybe there's some um, genus here. You express these scattering amplitudes as integrals over the moduli space, in this case 3, 4, of some measure. And that measure depends on the ingoing momenta and spins, or in general, the, uh, the characteristics of the states going in and out. And one way of thinking about these integrals is that this generalizes the uh, formulation of Feynman diagram amplitudes in terms of Schwinger parameters. So if you imagine collapsing this, so you collapse the, the, the tubes so that they're just lines, then the moduli would be like uh, lengths of those lines, and those would be kinds of Schwinger parameters. So that's one remark. The other remark is that you can write very explicit homomorphisms into SL2R. So there's actually, now a days, there are very beautiful coordinates on Teichmuller space. And roughly speaking, what you do is you take a triangulation of the Riemann surface, and you put some real numbers on the edges of that triangulation, and then you start writing some matrices like uh, 0x minus 1 over x 0, um, and um, 1 minus 1, 1, 0, and things like that. And you take products of matrices like this, and you get very explicit uh, uh, mappings of um, homomorphisms into PSL2R. And there's a, a very nice paper of Fock and Goncharov um, that does that quite explicitly. Okay, so that's a little bit about moduli space. Now, a little more about Riemann surfaces. So last time, we discussed in detail hyperelliptic curves. Let me remind you just one or two things about that. So a hyperelliptic curve was the set of solutions of y squared equals p of x inside C2, where p of x is, let's say, a degree n polynomial with simple roots. And I'm not going to go over what we did last time in too much detail. What we found was that, uh, that sigma 
over C, where we take x and y and we project that to x in C, that we found that that's a branched cover. And the branch locus was um, the, uh, the roots of the polynomial P. And then at the very end, I showed you that by including one or two points at infinity, we can embed this into a branched cover of sigma bar over P1, where this is compact of genus the degree of P minus 1 over 2 greater than integer. So I showed you that. Moreover, I indicated how you could go about writing down a Darboux basis for H1. I think I forgot to say a Darboux basis, uh, that's H lower one. I forgot to say that um, when I talked about the intersection forms, I said that you could always choose a basis so that the intersection form looked like that. And I neglected to say that that is called a Darboux basis. So a Darboux basis is a basis of homology cycles, let's say, of alpha sub i and beta upper i. i goes from 1 up to genus, such that this oriented intersection number satisfies these relations. I beta j equals delta i j. Okay. So that's that's what I drew before when I wrote these alpha and beta signs. basis, let me remind you, was to choose, okay, the zeros, the branch points. Okay, supposing the branch points look like this. They don't have to be collinear. That just makes it a little easier to draw. Let me just, uh, suppose there were eight branch points. So we have a genus 3 curve. Then what I should do is I should choose a system of cuts. I choose a system of cuts. And then having done this, on the complement of these cuts, I can choose a well-defined root of my equation, y squared equals p of x. So you should think above this blackboard, think of this blackboard as the complex plane, the x-plane. So this is the x-plane. Now above this x-plane, we can choose, uh, for each, each point here, we can choose two unambiguous roots of this equation, y squared equals p of x. You see, the problem is that near a zero of p of x, the roots get permuted, as we discussed. So you need to choose cuts in order to have a single, well-defined y that um, doesn't get, come back to minus itself. OK. Now, we can do something like this. We can choose. Uh, this is alpha 1, let's say oriented this way, and this is beta 1, oriented this way, and you see the, we are using alpha, we're using the right hand rule, so alpha with beta is plus 1, so it's, it's, it's good. Now we could choose alpha 2, like so, and uh, beta 2, like so. And we can choose alpha 3, like that, and beta 3, like that. Now, why don't I define an alpha 4? It's compacted by it. Good. Excellent. So this x, I'm thinking in terms of the, 
in terms of the compact surface. So this X is sitting inside P, P, CP1. So this blackboard, on this blackboard, the point at infinity is identified to a single point. And so if I chose an alpha 4, then I could flip it off the black back of the sphere, so the back of the blackboard, so to speak, and shrink it to 0. So that wouldn't be an interesting homology. So, so this is a homology basis for my genus 3 curve. Now, what I want to talk about now is what happens when I think about families of surfaces. I've been talking about moduli space of Riemann surfaces, okay? So as we vary P, we move around in the moduli space in general. You see, we have a family a family of Riemann surfaces parameterized by P. So one way of uh, saying what this is, is that, well, we could say that uh, Y squared equals AN times the product from Y equals 1 to N of X minus rho I, where rho I are the roots. Now this an is clearly not, not really a parameter, because I could just make a simple coordinate redefinition of y. And so I can set an to 1 by coordinate redefinition. Now the rho i, those really are parameters. And as I change the rho i, I change my polynomial, and I change my Riemann surface. Now what do we know about these rho i's? I'm stressing this. We know that the row i's are all different, right? So the row i's are different. And so what our family is, once we put that a n to 0, is the following space. It's called the configuration space of n points on the plane. So this is a, a nice example of a configuration space. So this is a space. It's an n-dimensional complex space. And uh, we have our family parameterized by this n-dimensional complex space. Now, I should say that we haven't quite guaranteed that uh, no two points in this space correspond to inequivalent Riemann surfaces. You see, we could still. Now, uh, x goes to ax plus b, right? That's a simple change of coordinates. And so we can put rho naught equal to 0 and rho 1 equal to 1. Now, at this point, we've, we've basically used up our degrees of freedom in redefining x and y. Now, here you have to be a little careful. If the degree of P is odd, then remember we had a branch point out at infinity. So the only conformal automorphisms of CP1 is SL2C, or rather PSL2C, acting by Mobius transformations. So if I've got a branch point at infinity, then I'm only allowed to make uh, redefinitions of X which fix infinity, and that's these. Okay. And then by putting rho naught equals zero and rho one equals one, I've used up that degree of freedom. All those, all this freedom here. If n is even, then there's no branch point in infinity. So okay, so I, I use this degree of freedom to put a branch point at infinity. And then I have the previous case. So without loss of generality, we can take n odd and rho naught equals 0 and rho 1 equals 1. And then 
when, what's, what's the good of doing that, then all curves in the family are inequivalent. Now, how big is this space? Well, we have genus G equals n minus 1 over 2, so n is equal to 2g plus 1, and we have an n minus 2 uh, dimensional parameter space, which is, if we plug in, uh, 2g minus 1. Now recall that the dimension of the moduli space of genus G curves with no punctures is 3g minus 3. So you see that we're only describing a small subspace of this 3g minus 3 dimensional moduli space. Unless, of course, the genus is 2. Okay. These two formulas agree for genus 2. But for higher genus, this is only a sub subspace of the space of all remote surfaces. So not all remote surfaces are hyperlimited. Uh, all, all, all genus uh, 1 and 2 curves are hyperlimited. Okay. So I have this family of Riemann surfaces. Now what do I want to do with it? Before I say what I want to do with it, I want to make one more remark. One more remark. Now it's really crucial that the row i is not equal to rho j here. So you could ask what happens when some rho i approaches rho j. Well, let's imagine that these two points collide. What happens to our surface? What happens is that a curve pinches. You see? When these two collide, if you think about how, how you get this curve here, then some curve is pinching. Or if I made these two points collide, then I would have um, you know, something like this. Some other curve would pitch. But the easiest one to visualize is when these two collide, and then I have this kind of boundary. Okay, so you so when rows collide, then some curve is shrinking to zero called a vanishing cycle. And so these kinds of degenerating Riemann surfaces form a kind of boundary to the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And you can compactify the moduli space of Riemann surfaces by including these complex codimension one points inside, in, into your space. So it's, it's like taking a, a disk, which is punctured, and then compactifying it by including the point in the center. Okay, now, what do I want to do with these, this family? Well, let me remind you that we have this homology lattice. Okay, so we have this homology lattice, and so we have a very interesting covering space of n points in the complex plane. So supposing that rho, let's say rho vector, is such a point, what is that covering? Well, to rho vector we've associated this compact Riemann surface, and to that we can take, let's call it lambda rho, which is the first homology of Sigma rho. Oops. And 
that, as I stressed before, that's equal to a lattice. Okay? So for each of these curves, I have this lattice. So as a group, it's a free abelian group, z to the 2g. It's got this intersection form I've talked about. And you see I have this lattice over each point in the configuration space. I see a lot of puzzled looks. Ask some questions. Is it clear? Yeah, okay. yep. I'll ask a question. Yep. So okay, I start in row, and then I get this sigma, then I get this lambda, mm -hmm. and h1. And then which lattice? H1 is a lattice. So H1 is a group of those. So we are talking, for example, about this taboo, this taboo basis, right? For example, is the integer combinations, right? Good. Integer combinations of these alphas and beta. Yeah. So this is the span. So this is the set of all n i alpha i plus m i beta i, where n i and m i are in z. Good. So, so, so what is the lattice here? Ah. This is a lattice. Oh, so you just call this lattice. Okay. It is a lattice. That's, that's why I call it a lattice. It's, it's a free abelian group on two G generators, and it has an intersection form. Yeah. Okay. Now what I'm saying is that here we have this space of rows. This is, a, this is a, let's say, this is a picture of the configuration space of endpoints on the plane. And for every row, I have this lattice sitting over it, this discrete abelian group. And now I'm going to move row around, and my lattice is going to move around. And so I have an infinite covering. Okay. So now we can apply our covering theory. Question, is this covering trivial or not? Do you think? that as we, do you think we can choose these homology cycles sort of uniformly over this whole space so that we can just write this thing as a product Cn of C times Z to the 2G. That would be a trivialization of my covering, right? This is an example of a principal bundle. The structure group is this abelian group, Z to the 2G. You see that for each row, I have this canonically defined lattice. But I have to make choices if I, define, if I identify it with z to the 2g. I have to choose some basis to identify it. It's only when I've chosen a Darboo basis that I can say, oh ho, everybody in here is a linear combination of alpha and beta cycles, and this ni and mi give me a point in this z to the 2g. So how do we decide? How do we decide if our covering is trivial or not? What did we learn last lecture? I think it was two lectures ago. There is a global section. So that's the same as choosing this branch cut to nuclear or something? Well, choosing the branch, what I've said here is that if I've chosen a system of branch cuts, then there's a canonical basis, which I drew. But I could choose some other set of branch cuts. So then there's another basis. Okay, so if, so if you can uniquely find the branch cuts, then you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, if I could find the branch cuts that are unique, I could. So remember that um, you're on the right track. What we showed was that discrete coverings are classified by their monodromy representation. Remember, we had the theorem that the um, isomorphism classes of principal gamma bundles over some space x is hum of pi 1 of x into gamma modulo the conjugation action of gamma. We proved that, I think, two lectures ago. And remember that the idea here is to study the monodromy. So the question is, is what is the monodromy of this lattice? Okay. 
Okay? Well, first question is, what is pi 1 of this configuration space of n points and c? Well, it's clear that it's not 0. Because, you see, you can have the following situation. So, here are the zeros. And supposing I have this one, uh, row i, and, uh, let's say, oh, sorry, let's call that row j, and let's call this one row k, and now let's consider a path where I keep all of the uh, zeros constant, except I move this guy over here and this guy over here. That's a closed path in the configuration space. So as, as t goes from 0 to 1, this moves from here to here, and this moves from here to here. That's a closed path because at the end of that path, I'm back to where I started. With. These two guys have exchanged points, but it's it, but still the, uh, the same thing I started with. So this is a closed loop in Cn of C. Okay. Now, in fact, if these generate, these generate pi 1 of Cn of C, and this is something called the Artin braid group. And there are all sorts of uh, fantastic things we could say about the Artin break group. You could give a whole course on it, in fact. But I'm not going to take that detour. Suffice it to say, it's a much studied, much loved group. And it, you see, you, I hope you can see that it comes up very naturally when you think about things like anions in 2 plus 1 dimensions. If you think of those zeros as particles and think about their statistics, their statistics will be a representation of the Artin Bray group. And if that representation doesn't, isn't one dimensional, then those particles would be called non abelians. Uh, something of some interest. Okay. But that's not where we're going. We want to look at the monodromy of this system of lattices around this closed curve in our space of Riemann surfaces. So let's try and do that. Okay? So it's kind of a local problem. Supposing we have call it this. Okay, supposing we have um, four branch points. Call them like this. Uh, row I, row J, row K, and row L. Now, let's suppose we choose this system of cuts. Okay. So then, as I've said, where's my purple? Orange. Then, as I've said, we have some natural cycles. Let's call this the A cycle. And let's call this guy the B cycle. Everybody understand what I mean by the dashed line? Yeah? Okay. That's the B cycle. And then, you know, there's some other branch points somewhere else, and we we choose cuts so that these don't interfere with any of those other branch points. So we're just studying these four points. So our intersection number then, our intersection products then are A with A is B with B is 0, and A with B is minus B with A is plus 1. So therefore, if I have any homology class gamma, which sits in the two-dimensional space spanned by A and B, then any cycle gamma can be written as gamma B A minus gamma A B. If 
gamma is in the two-dimensional space span I, A, and B. All right. Now, let's take our yellow chalk, and now let's move this branch point here and this branch point here, okay, to make a closed curve in the configuration space. Now, as we move, as time goes by slowly, we can slowly evolve this cut and this cut and slowly evolve this cycle and that cycle. And what do we get? So time goes by, and we get we get a picture like this. Now this branch cut goes like that, and this branch cut goes like that. And now our purple curve has evolved into A prime. And our other curve, our orange curve, has evolved into that, B prime. Okay, so A prime is a at t equals 1. So you see we have an a of t and a b of t as time goes by. This is t goes from 0 to 1. And b prime is equal to b at t equals 1. Okay, and again, this is rho i, rho j, rho k, rho l. Well, okay, so they look different, right? So let, let's try and calculate what's happened here. So we go back to our original set of cuts. With our original basis, Now let's let's see what happens to a prime. So I better use a different color. So a prime looks like that. Okay, that's a prime. So now let's calculate. A prime with A. Well, this is A, this is B. Okay, so let me ask you, how many points does A prime and A intersect in? What? One. One. Because you see here, that's not an intersection, because the dashed line shows me that the blue curve is on the other sheet. Okay, and uh, let's 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 get our our orientations right. So we have a prime here and a like that. So right hand rule. So this is equal to minus one. Okay, and now what about a prime with b? Okay, so here plus one. Great. Right. Okay, so a prime is, if I now look at that formula over there, a plus b. How about b prime? b prime is like that. Okay, so that's b prime. So b prime is equal to b. So we found some non-trivial monodromy. So here's the 
picture. Ah, I'm out of time again. So here's the picture. Let me introduce some local coordinate delta equals rho j minus rho k squared. And I'm holding all the other rows to, uh, fixed. And so I have some disk here, the delta disk. And at the origin, I have a singular Riemann surface that's sitting about delta equals zero. And if delta is not zero, I have some non-singular surface. Okay. And I have um, A and B. But now, as I take a path around the origin, what I get back at the end is uh, mislabeled them. Yeah. Okay, so to correspond to that picture, that's A and B, sorry about that. Okay, so B prime is the same, but A prime is that. Okay, so this is, we have delta goes to E to the 2 pi i t to delta. This is the picture at t equals 0, this is the picture at t equals 1. So now we have this non-trivial monodromy. And this is called uh, Lefschetz monodromy. And this is a very, very general phenomenon. So what we have is gamma sub v is the vanishing cycle, in this case v. That's the cycle that pinches when the surface becomes singular. And the monodromy takes gamma, goes to gamma plus gamma intersection product gamma v times gamma v. That's the left shift's formula. Okay? So that's non-trivial monotropy. So that means that this family of Riemann surfaces, or sorry, this family of lattices is a non-trivial family. And these generate a monodromy group because these braidings generate the Artine braid group and because we have that formula up there. Now finally, one of the nicest applications of this is to n equals 2 four-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory. So, in 94, uh, Zyberg and Witten made a breakthrough. They showed how one could describe the uh, vacuum dynamics and uh, important constraints on the spectrum of the theory, on the spectrum of particles, they didn't completely show, get to the spectrum of particles, but they uh, made major progress in finding constraints on the spectrum of particles um, in exact terms. And the, the key mathematical construction turned out to involve a family of Riemann surfaces so the rows were like parameters of the moduli space of Acta the 
the, um, the lattice, lambda rho, was a lattice of electric and magnetic charges. And this phenomenon of monodromy was key to solving the model and um, key to solving the model and uh, understanding certain interesting um, physical phenomena way over time. So I'm going to stop. I'll say just a tiny bit more about this next time before we move on to our next topic. Um, but from what I've, what I've told you, you can see that something interesting has to happen if you accept this identification of this lambda rho with a lattice of electric and magnetic charges. So these A, a cycles and B cycles are like electric and magnetic charges. This intersection product that I've been talking about is identified with a very standard intersection product between electric and magnetic charges, which we'll talk about when we talk about Dirac quantization and monopoles. And this, uh, this phenomenon of monodromy means that these electric and magnetic charges can transform, can change under closed loops in moduli spaces of vacuum. Okay. So Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just say a tiny bit more about this next time. We can't take a detour into cyber witness theory. But um, this was actually one of my main motivations for wanting to explain to you about hyperelliptic curves and uh, this, this family. Oh, I forgot to hand out notes. Sorry.